welcome you to the Canadian Donation and Transplantation Research Program's first workshop on ODT and health literacy entitled Learning from Each Other. I'd first like to start by acknowledging that the CDTRP is hosted by the University of Alberta. Uh, I also uh, uh, live in Edmonton in uh, the same city and I'd like, like I would personally like and also on behalf of the university uh, to respectfully acknowledge that this is um, this is located on territory, the Treaty Six territory, a tr traditional gathering place for many diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others. Uh, and we uh, acknowledge that those histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence uh, our community today and we're very happy to be here. This event will be the first of a series in 2022 that aims to bring together journalists as well as media specialists, both traditional and social media specialists, together with researchers, health professionals, and patient family and donor partners who have expertise in the field of donation and transplantation. So today we aim to engage members of the media, as well as experts in the donation and transplantation communities in a discussion that will lead, uh, that's aimed to lead to enhanced and deeper collaborations, contributing to building a strong culture uh, and strengthening the culture of organ and tissue donation. Our goal is to make it easier for members of the media to understand and report on the key issues in donation and transplantation, and also conversely, for us to understand the needs of, of journalists and media specialists for specific, precise, and accurate information in a timely fashion. So it's a two-way learning street here. As an introduction, we'll hear about, uh, we'll hear from um, Belen Velasco Conquero, who is the Chief Communication Officer at the National Transplant Organization, or the ONT, which is the Spanish National Authority responsible for the oversight, coordination, and organization of donation and clinical uh, use of organs in Spain, uh, organs, tissues, and cells in Spain. Belen is a, is a journalist. She's a specialist in health and science in particular, and she joined the ONT in January 2020 after 10 years working as the health editor in the national newspaper La Raison. Uh, actually, that's Spanish. I shouldn't be giving it a French accent. I suppose it would be La Raison. <laughs> Raison. She's in charge of all the PR areas of the ONT, as well as the digital strategy for, uh, for the ONT. And communication has always been part of the very well-known Spanish, Spanish model of organ donation and transplantation, and it's really acknowledged as one of their enormous strengths. Um, and we've had many conversations with Beatriz Dominguez Gil and other colleagues in Spain uh, about how this has been achieved. Um, and really, we're, we're aiming to learn from, um, from Belen and, and her many colleagues. This good relationship with journalists, national, international, as well as um, um, the alliances that the ONT has created with other stakeholders, including patients, scientific societies, industry, companies, um, foundations, and so on, um, has helped them spread the message really effectively and accurately, such that 80%, 86% of Spanish citizens actually say yes to organ donation. So um, we're going to hear, as I said, first from Belen, and uh, her title, uh, the title of her presentation is The Spanish Model, Journalists and Social Media, Essential Allies. So I hand it over to you, Belen. Thank you very much, Elori. Nice to meet you all, and thank you for having me here. I'm really glad to, to, to be here in a workshop with uh, all colleagues, because uh, as you said, I'm a journalist. I'm a journalist. I work in La Razón, as you said, quite well, um, for 10 years in, in the health area. And now I started working in ONT uh, two years ago. 
and and it's been really really challenging for me because uh, as you know the pandemic and the COVID-19 has been a challenge for all the journalists here and here in Spain so I'm going to try uh, as you said to to show you how we work here in Spain how we work with media how we work with journalism and with journalists and uh, how does this help us to send the message to all the, the citizens here in Spain that we have, as you said, a really high uh, percentage of people that say yes to donation. And, and it's it's quite uh, awesome, but it's also because of the good relationships, relationships we have with, with journalists. I'm gonna share my presentation. Can you all see it? I guess okay. so. Yes, perfect. So uh, as I said, it's um, it's quite a, it's one of the main uh, actors of our um, of our organization to be in touch daily with journalism, and that's that's my main job. I usually work with them uh, daily, and I have calls with them daily. So I'm going to explain you with more more. I've, I've done it more with examples because I think it's it's more useful. But if you have any any question of or about anything, I I get by I pass by you just uh, stop me or just ask me later as, as you wish uh, well um, the main reason we, we, a lot of people here we, they ask us um, usually when we talk out, uh, outside Spain why are we uh, the main uh, the world leader in organ donation since 1992 so there are a lot of uh, medical and technical uh, issues related to this, but I'm gonna focus on the on the media one. So now I'm gonna show you a little bit for those who doesn't know uh, who don't know how we work here in 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 ONT. I'm gonna show you a, sh a really short video about how we how we coordinate donation and transplantation here. I don't know, uh, Stephanie, do you want to share it better than I? Do I stop sharing it now? I I will. Yes. Do I stop it? Okay. But there are more reasons behind Spain's success. Although presumed consent was introduced in Spain in 1979, it was only with the introduction of the Organización Nacional de Transplantes, the National Transplant Organization, a decade later, that the donation rates really began to improve. Transporting a donor organ in time can be a real challenge. A heart may last for just four hours, a liver up to eight hours, the pancreas only seven, kidneys perhaps as much as a day. It falls to coordinator teams in hospitals across Spain to know which patients want to donate their organs in the event that they die. And, crucially, to find out if their loved ones consent to this after the patient's death. It is often end-of-life conversations that doctors and nurses have with patients and their families through which consent is given. Taking the time to introduce organ donation to a patient's relatives makes it much more likely that they will consent in the event of death. In Spain, it is increasingly common to find donors in their 70s, 80s, and in a few cases, their 90s. Last year, the oldest deceased donor was 91, Organ transplants can have great cost savings too. By performing thousands of kidney transplants a year and keeping patients off dialysis, healthcare systems can save over twice the cost of all their solid organ transplants. Five years of hemodialysis, which uses an artificial kidney outside the body to filter blood, would cost over €160,000 more per patient than a transplant. All things considered, it is far more likely that you will require a donor organ than die in conditions that allow for the donation of your own organs. Spain has led the world in organ donation for decades. So, what's stopping other countries catching up? Well, this, uh, I'm going to share it again. Thank you, Stephanie, for, for the backup. So this is a, a video we, we did for, for a UK um, journal in uh, 2018, but it's quite quite uh, the same we work uh, right now. And uh, um, I don't know if I can pass, oh yeah, of course. I want to show you this little, um, in, this, in this slide, how do uh, people here in Spain 
uh, uh, think about uh, organ donation. And as you see, we have a really, really high uh, uh, percentage of consent and of um, people that would like to be organ donor after their deaths, as, as I show you here in, the, in this slide. It's really unusual here in Spain to ask people uh, what uh, what are their feelings? How do they feel after uh, if they would like to be an organ donor? And we usually have, as as Laurie said before, like a, a around eighty six percent of a affirmative answer. So it's quite a use. And here is when when I start my my role. I I like I'll, to show with my colleagues here in Spain. Uh, this this is like sometimes, or I put them a, a short video because as you a lot of you may may know this this. Uh, this TV series, uh, this TV show, uh, the newsroom that's that was uh, launched in in 2012, um, they show a lot of how they work in the media and how they try to to show people the the truth and the to be transparent. And it it was really difficult for them to show the uh, this. And they, as as I put it here, they try to to show uh, the the audience the role of, of real journalists to be transparent to be. Uh, to have a key role in in the, our societies, that it's to show the reality of what is happening, and for us in ONT, it's really really important. Here, I uh, I would like to I will after after this slide, I will uh, give you examples of all of this, but I want to show you in these four uh, points what are the main um, the main focal points for her, <clears throat> sorry for us to to work uh, with journalism as you see we are available i am my colleague i have a colleague that works with me maria and we work uh, almost every day uh, if someone calls or needs something or there's a, an emergency or a, i don't know we we try to to get them the information and we also have a really 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 Good spokesperson. That's our chief. That's Beatriz, uh, who Laurie talked about before, and she she knows how to deal with them. She's prepared. We show her how how to um, talk with media, uh, what kind of things she must say, how how to be more more near. How, so this is very important for us and for journalism here in Spain because they call us and they know they will have an answer. So connection with journalists here, and I I believe everywhere it's essential and a good control of the information without intermediaries. I, I mean intermediaries is that we ONT, we are part of the Ministry of Health here in Spain, but we work on as, as an autonomous um, institution. So I work by myself. I try, I, I usually have uh, conversations with the uh, with the team over there in, in the ministry, but they know I can work uh, and I can deal with, with things just, just by myself because it's easier and it's faster. Uh, here I try to to give you some examples. They are in Spanish, but I, I translated here the the main titles of kind the kind of um, relationships and the kind of uh, news we offer journalism journalists here in Spain, and they ask us for. Uh, in one side, the the one of the this, this mother she she had a traffic accident. Um, a car accident, sorry, and his uh, her son uh, died in the car accident. And well, uh, as as you see, she 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 get disabled and she was in a wheelchair. Uh, but at that moment, in that tragic moment, she decided that she wanted uh, to donate the organs of, of his of her son. And for her, it, it was really a relief. So uh, we this kind of of news uh, all here, all journalists when I, when we tell them we have this kind of, of testimony, they, they really enjoy them. And they, they like to show them these kind of things because they could help others. They help other parents, they help people that are waiting for an organ and they know people are there for them. So it's kind of, of a mutual win-win um, as we say. Uh, and, and we help both sides. And in the other, in the other side, you see it, we, it's transplant lives. These, these are three people that they were transplanted. And they receive uh, an organ, uh, and they tell them they tell the, how, how did they 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 live without uh, all these the the way they 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 live now with their new organ and how their lives have become much better. So we uh, try to adjust our work to the the needs of journalists to show all our network, which we show not only Madrid. We have a lot of 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 hospitals in Madrid, in Spain that work with.
organ donation and transplantation. So we try to show everything here. And of course, it's very important for us also to show the work here in ONT. And as I show you here, this was uh, the main, the core, these three, uh, these seven people, uh, they built what we know now as the ONT. They were like a, a doctor and seven nurses who started this, this huge adventure. And, and last year, one of them, uh, the one I show you here, it was, uh, he, he retired, she retired. So I asked, I told the, the story of this, this nurse and how she uh, worked so hard here in ONT to one of our of the journalists and he, he was amazed about the story of this woman and he, he did this, this piece. So it's kind of very, very, um, for us, it's, it, it helps to show everything that we do here, not only patients. Well, I, I show here in this slide like three examples of how we may have a, a controversial, pro controversial projects and may, we may explain it better as we just have the, the xenotransplant transplant there in the, in the States. Or we have like in 2020, the first uterus transplant here in Spain. So uh, we try to elaborate internal QA and fix an a unique position and I, our spokesperson Beatrice, she, also, she always knows about the news that are happening. She, she, she's like always in charge of, of all these things and how to explain it to people. It's really, really important to show, to explain it to the journalists the way they understand it, as, as you know, because if, if they understand it correctly, they will uh, after uh, show it and uh, write it correctly. So it's it's a quite important thing to choose the, the spokesperson. Uh, here, I don't know if you know, but here in Spain, we have the transplant law protects organ, organ donor privacy. So we try to guarantee the, the anonymity of organ donors and recipients, because in the past, in the, in the first years of, of activity, we had some problems with uh, with these uh, with families that keep try to keep touch. I don't know how it works there in Canada, but I know that in the states they it's they are they are allowed to to meet each other, but not here in Spain, as we try to protect privacy from one another, as the law uh, says. But we sometimes the the thing I I, I show you here the this news it's that sometimes we can't uh, protect everything, and and here in Canarias in the islands. They started an, a hard program, and it was so easy when they, the journalists, the journalists over there uh, write the first piece that uh, the families try to uh, keep in touch, as I saw you here in the in the Facebook uh, picture. I saw you. Um, well, we we act quickly, and we this happened sometimes, but it's really really uh, we don't we don't have this kind of of problems usually because here the journalists know how important it is to protect it so they call us to ask uh, can i say the date can i say some so it's very um our it's very easy to work with them and they work with us so quickly and so uh, engaged that that i think that's uh, one of the our main strengths well and uh, uh, social media just pass by some social media how we work in social media because i think as most of you know, uh, it's essential also to have a presence in social media. Here at first it was, a, they were a bit, a bit um, I, I, I don't know if it, to say they have a fear to, to get in, in, this, in this new area, but uh, as we started and we got more and more followers and we started to, to build a strategy to show people we usually how we work, what do we publish? We use our social media, Twitter and Instagram, most of it, uh, to show how we work, the, the scientific uh, publications we make, the last data. Uh, we are, uh, I don't know if you know, but here in Spain, Spain is, is, uh, is a, we collaborate directly with, with WHO. So we elaborate all, all the, um, all the data about a don a donation and transplantation activity in the world. So for us, it's very important also to show everything we do here and to show how the activity worldwide uh, works. Uh, and we also use the social media, just um, as I show you here, 
to answer questions or to detect uh, possible crimes, like uh, a question from a from a young one, from a teenager that he wanted to become organ donor. So he asked us, and we uh, faster we we answered him that it's it, we were really proud of him, and it was uh, very nice to hear from him at that age. But we have also uh, some questions and some uh, sentences and. Of people that want to of, or try to ask us if they could sell a, a kidney, or um, they are people that they don't really know uh, what they are saying. We believe they they they, they are from uh, countries with uh, wealth really really low. So we just es explain to them that this is a, a crime and, and a felony, and so we we just try to to show them that's not the best way of acting. Uh, well, in in Instagram, we also have presence. Just uh, September twenty twenty one, we started with our um, with our uh, we started uh, working here in Instagram because we saw it as a as a main um, role. We have to be where potential bone don bone marrow donors may be uh, for our for our register. So we started really really with just a few followers, but it's been very useful to. To get in touch with people, to to interact, as as I saw you in the next slide, they ask us a lot of things. Organ donors, patients, recipients, they they tell us uh, their how they feel, how, how they expect their or uh, their life to be, and it's uh, we're we're creating a community with them. That's very important for us also to to create all this uh, this way of thinking in Spain of organ donation as as part of the end of life. Uh, we be, we also make specific campaigns uh, related to to what we do or to or, and we um, we um, we use it uh, in Twitter we use it in Instagram and we also send uh, press releases uh, with the Ministry of Health to show them the activity or, or any news we believe it they may be uh, interesting for journalists. Well, we have also uh, YouTube, but uh, we just use it uh, to create like with all the coordinations and with all the scientific societies and with the patients. We we are really really we close so uh, we work so close. So we use it as to you to 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 webinars to use it for webinars or a special days like the donor day or the transplant a national day, and it's been really useful also for for that for that issue. And I just want to finish my my introduction with um, how how COVID um, nineteen impacted uh, here in Spain, I guess uh, in Canada too, but most of it how we managed to to control this crisis. For me, it was like really challenging because I was like, to, uh, I I became uh, the chief officer here uh, in January twenty twenty, and this started in March, so it was like two months just to to keep in touch and to. And to know how it worked uh, after 10 years in, in a journal. So it, uh, we decided uh, we have to, to make it an opportunity. So we saw how um, transparency as, main, as one of our main uh, values here in UNT and, um, and just to be accessible uh, uh, and entire the, the network. Uh, so they can help us also to translate, uh, to, to show uh, patients and to show uh, citizens here in Spain that we were working for them and, and, and we didn't stop. And just here, the, my last slide is, uh, I just put here in, in some words, the, like the main uh, tips we have here to survive uh, in the media in the, and in social media. And as I told you in, in, my, in my presentation, we, we try to be really close to journalists. We avoid technical terms and give a lot of examples to them so they 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 understand quite good how how it works and uh, how our activity works. We offer uh, update data uh, yearly, every year, or uh, during COVID, uh, almost every month, so they would know how the uh, how the um, the virus affected our activity. Well, we try to give images and and show them that this is really powerful for them. We avoid extra information. Uh, we think it's. It, it's it's not helpful, and we try to protect, as I told you, the patients and their privacy. Uh, we have persons in social media because we know that they will talk about you no matter what. So better to be there. And uh, we try to be prepared for news that may appear anytime, any way. 
Uh, also, uh, fixed alliances is very important for us, and it's been working since 1989. So we try to to keep on uh, with that. So thank you, thank you very much for for your time. And I, if you need anything from me, or I just give you my my email address, so I can keep in touch with you. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Belén. Gracias. <laughs> It's a wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you so much for giving us that overview of how things are going in Spain. It's certainly inspiring. Um, so just a note to the attendees, please. Uh, we've already got a few um, questions, but please submit questions to, into the chat and we'll collect those during the presentations. And once all the presentations are complete, we'll then have a 30 minute uh, panel discussion followed by a 35 minute open discussion. And so um, we've got uh, time for time for lots of discussion. So we'll move ahead now with the moderators for the workshop. Um, and uh, that's Christina Hoaran and Mary Bocage. Christina is an award-winning investigative journalist and documentary producer with City TV in Toronto. Her latest film, Verac Veracity, uh, Fighting Traffic, uh, focused on sex trafficking in Canada. And Christina was embedded with a group of advocates to stake out uh, various hotels and identified Johns and traffickers in London, Ontario. It's a project she uh, could not have under, understood doing um, just a few years ago because she had been diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease in early 2018 uh, and found herself joining many thousands of Canadians um, undergoing dialysis uh, for hours every day. But Christina was also lucky to be the recipient of a kidney from um, a, a courageous donor, her cousin, Christine Hodgkinson, and she shared her journey from diagnosis to transplant with City TV viewers and with Chatelaine readers. Christina is the recipient of the Kidney Foundation of Canada's 2021 Award for Public Awareness, and we're very excited to have her here today. Mary Bocage is Anishinaabe from Nip Nipissing First Nation outside of North Bay in Ontario. She spent 24 years uh, working with people in uh, the field of retail management. Mary has type 2 diabetes and was diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease in 2013, uh, for which she too underwent dialysis. And in March of 2015, she received a kidney from her cousin in Manitoba. Mary is well known to this group of, uh, to, to, to CDTRP investigators and, and, um, and um, members. She co-chairs the CanSolve CKD. Well, she does so many things. She's uh, the, the CanSolve CKD Network's Patient Governance Circle and Indig Indigenous Peoples Engagement Research Council. And she's a, a, a CDTRP theme lead. Um, Mary recently became a board member of the National Indigenous Diabetes Association. And she's been a presenter, a panel member, a facilitator, uh, provincially, nationally, and, and internationally. Uh, we know Mary as a, as a vulnerable and engaging storyteller who um, trusts you with her story. She's interested in educating and advocating in matters of Indigenous health, patient partnership, chronic kidney disease research, as well as in donation and transplantation. And so uh, at this time, I'll turn things over to Christina. Christina, please go ahead. Oops, you're muted, uh, Christina. Yes. You're muted. No, I think you're, yeah, there you I'm, go. I'm here I am, sorry about there that. You go. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you, Lori, and thank you, Baleen, for a very informative presentation. It's really interesting to hear and to see how um, things are happening out in Spain and how you do work with journalists because it is so important. Quick side note, and I hope nobody minds me saying this, I just want to congratulate Mary. Um, I just found out today that her CanSolve CKD received significant funding um, from the CIHR. And I just think that she's a phenomenal moderator, but a phenomenal person. And I'm really happy to hear that her research projects are getting the green light. With that being said, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker for the workshop. His name is Timothy Caulfield. Now, Timothy Caulfield is a Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy, a professor in the Faculty of Law in the School of Public Health, and the Research Director of the Health Law Institute at the University of Alberta. His interdisciplinary research on topics like stem cells, genetics, research ethics, the public representations of science and public health policy has allowed him to publish over 350 academic articles. 
He's won numerous academic and writing awards and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and he frequently contributes to the popular press. Now, just a quick reminder, we're gonna invite everybody to post your question in the chat during presentations and our panel discussions. There's gonna be an open discussion at the end of the session. So just remember, if you've got anything you wanna know more about, just hit the chat and type away your questions. And I know that uh, Mary's going to be monitoring that very closely. So let's get started with our first presentation. Thank you, Timothy. Thanks so much, uh, Christina. And uh, my presentation is going to be very straightforward. Uh, I'm really here to, I think, warm everyone up about uh, why uh, the media matters. Now, this may seem obvious, it may seem obvious, especially after that wonderful presentation by Belen, uh, but it's important to reflect on the degree to which this is the case. The media really does matter. At the Health Law Institute with my colleagues like Robin Hyde-Laid and, and Sandro Marcon, we've been studying this for decades. And we've been studying how health and science issues are represented, not only in the popular press, which is going to be my focus in my brief time here, but, but also on social media. And we know it has a tremendous impact. That, that may sound obvious, but it's important to recognize that, that the media really does, how it, how it frames things does impact actual policy. We've seen this in our own research in the context of things like you know, stem cell research, reproductive technologies, gen genomics, and of course, of course, of course, in the context of COVID. It really does matter. It has an impact on, on public and patient expectations. I mean, really interesting research done in the context of transplantation there. So how this is framed in the media impacts how the public thinks about this. Uh, and, and, and some indication, some indication, and I'll come back to that, that it even has an impact on clinical decisions. We've certainly seen that in other spheres, again, stem cell research, unproven stem cell therapies, a good example of that. But this really does matter, a tremendously important topic. Uh, and I think especially, especially now and in the context of policy. Look, we've done a, a very recent study uh, where we, it's still in press, uh, Sandra Marcon, my colleague, uh, really the lead on this, uh, where we looked at thousands thousands of articles in the popular press on the topic of transplantation. You know, so what's the press covering? What are they talking about? What's out there? What are the people seeing? Well, about 46% of all of those articles, not going to surprise this team here, they're about donors, they're about recipients, right? That's the focus. And, and I get it, right? These are human interest stories. This is what the public wants to see. I think a kind of surprising number, 32% are about policy. So they're about the controversial moves that are happening, perhaps controversial moves that are happening in, in the policy space. And 27% about, about awareness campaigns. I think that's kind of good news. What we, what we did find was there wasn't that much science. There wasn't that much evidence, right? There wasn't that much evidence. It's really, it really is about about stories, right? And, and that, and I love stories. <laughs> stories so powerful. I love stories. When I'm advocating about science communication, I would say, you know, make creativity wins, right? We've got to make this engaging. We've got to make this relevant. We've got to make it speak to people's values. But, but it really is about stories, right? There's, there's fascinating research, and I'm sure many people are aware of it, that talk about the potential harm that stories, testimonials, anecdotes can do. Uh, in skewing the direction of how the public views a topic. So for example, there's a really interesting study from 2016, and there've been a lot of studies on this, by the way, that highlighted that you know an anecdote, a testimonial, especially if it resonates with you, right, can overwhelm your critical thinking skills. It can overwhelm your uh, how you perceive the relevant data. And of course, we've seen that happen play out in the context of, for example, COVID and how risks are portrayed around uh, are misportrayed <laughs> around, around the vaccines. Uh, anecdotes can resonate and they can have a real impact. We have to remember that stories matter. I love stories, I love narratives, but we have to recognize the, the role that they can play. And one of the roles that they can play is they can emphasize something we call the rule of rescue. And this is something that at the Institute we've actually done a, a lot of work on in the context of, of the law and how, it's, how the rule of rescue is portrayed. But what do I mean by that? That the rule of rescue is sort of emphasizing that needy individual, right? That individual who needs something 
over perhaps a policy that is framed more in the collective, right? More in, uh, in the context of a broader public health care system, for example, the rule of rescue. And you guys know this, everyone who's involved in transplantation, you know this, this is a very powerful concept in the context of donation and transplantation for good and for bad. So let me just dig down a little bit in the brief time I have with you about, about the rule of rescue and how the stories and, and whatnot can, can kind of play out in the context of transplantation. We've done some interesting research again with my wonderful colleagues at the Institute on public solicitation. So what do I mean by that? These are these the ads that you see or perhaps social media posts you see where people are looking for an organ. And we did a study where we compared how, how the... Uh, the, the story about Eugene Melnick and, and the Wagner family, both, both parties looking for a liver donation, both using public so solicitation, how that played out in, in social media, how that played out in the popular press, very different. The Eugene Melnick, you know, the owner, a billionaire, I think he's a billionaire <laughs> of, the, of the Ottawa Senators at the time, uh, the Wagner family, uh, young young uh, twins all in the need of, a, of an organ donation played out very, very differently. Um, but both, both stories. Uh, stories and the rule of rescue can also have an interesting impact on emerging technologies. We've do, we're doing studies on how precision medicine is being portrayed uh, in the public sphere. So using genomic testing, for example, to optimize the delivery of organs. That sounds like a very, very good thing, right? But but it could also mean some people aren't going to get an organ, or perhaps it's going to be allocated differently than, say, a list might, might dictate. The rule of rescue and how the media portrays this can alter how the public, and we've seen this in the research, how the public thinks about emerging technologies, even if in the aggregate it's a good idea, how the media portrays this can have an interesting impact. And then let's talk about what you know played out over the pandemic vaccine policy, right? Uh, this was fascinating. And this is something that we are going to study at the Institute, how the media portrayed the requirement that you need to get a vaccine before you get a transplant was fascinating, right? Again, rule of rescue, talking about stories. It was for me remarkable the degree to which the idea that uh, getting a vaccine or requiring a vaccine before transplantation was viewed as controversial. Right? That's how it was portrayed. That was the story that was told. Right? Uh, and that is a really good example of how stories, narratives can, can have an impact on the public discourse. Um, and the last one I want to highlight is false balance. And I think this one is really important, especially in the context, especially in the context of policy. So what do I mean by false balance? Well, that's portraying a, a two positions as if they're equal, right? As if they're equal, as if the, the body of academic opinion is equally split. And we saw that all the time. We've done a lot of studies on this. We did a big one in the context of, of natural herd immunity in the context of, of COVID. And we found that you know, there was a lot of false balance out there. So false balance, falsely balancing an issue can have a real impact on public discourse. It can have a real impact, impact studies tell us on, on patient and public perceptions and even on clinical decisions. False balance can have a real impact. And so why am I raising this here? Because we have seen the degree to which work uh, that my colleague Sandra Marcon has done has found that, you know, loud voices, a handful of loud voices can really dictate how a, an issue like opt-out policies in Nova Scotia, for example, how it's portrayed in the popular press and how it's portrayed on social media. Now, before I, I close, I, I want to talk about one more, I think, really important issue. And this is, again, something that we've studied a lot, uh, a lot in, uh, at the Institute, and that is the issue of hype, the issue of hype. And, and this is something that we really have studied for, I think, three decades, it's embarrassing to say, but there, hype can do real harm. And, and there, that, that's hype across the spectrum. So we've seen hype, for example, on, on xenotransplantation rate lately. Very, very exciting, but often portrayed as if it's a near future solution, right? That can do harm. That can create un, uh, inappropriate expectations. We've done studies on hype in the context of the marketing of, uh, of cord blood products, you know, as if 
everyone needs to bank their cord, their kids' cord blood because their stem cell therapy is going to be available tomorrow, right? That can do real harm, right? It can be exploitive. But there can also be hype on the other side. There has also been hype in the context, in the context of, of transplantation. You know, what transplantation can actually do for an individual. As everyone involved in this knows, transplantation is just part of the journey. It's not the end of the journey, it's part of the journey. And unless that journey is portrayed accurately, we can do harm, not just to patient expectations, but to the policies that surround the transplantation uh, system. So yeah, uh, the media matters. It's really, really important. The conversation we're having today really, really matters. Thank you very much to all the organizers for bringing us together, because I think, I think this discussion is so, so important. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Thank you very much, Timothy, for an informative uh, presentation. I just want to remind everyone to post their questions in the chat during presentations and the panel discussion. We'll have an open discussion at the end of the session. Now we'll hear from our next perspective on ODT, organ donation and transplantation from Dr. Aviva Goldberg. Dr. Goldberg is a pediatric transplant nephrologist and an ethicist in Winnipeg, Manitoba. She is the section head of pediatric nephrology at the Max Reddy School, College of Medicine rather. She is the secretary of the Canadian Society of Transplantation and chairs the Kidney Allocation Committee of Transplant Manitoba. She co-edited the first book on pediatric transplant ethics. Her work focuses on transplant ethics, medical education and support and equity, diversity and inclusion. Over to you, Aviva. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Mary. And thank you uh, to all of you for being here and to the CDTRP for hosting this exciting workshop today. Um, what I'm gonna try to get across is admittedly from the perspective of a pediatric nephrologist, um, but I'm gonna try to represent the views of the ODT community as best I can here. And what I wanna convince you of today is that even though ODT numbers are small, the impact that we have on Canada is very large. I wanna emphasize, as Tim said, that transplant is not a cure and that it's important to remember that when we're covering media stories about it. I want to talk about how transplant science is long and iterative, complicated and exciting. And while we want to tell those stories, we do have to avoid that science hype. And a little bit about miracles and a plea to uh, view them as something that we can make uh, with the science and technology that we have to offer. So first of all, I do want to acknowledge where I am. So I'm here in Winnipeg, which is on the original lands of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, we respect the treaties that were made on these territories and acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. And we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And I want to particularly thank Mary for being one of the people who's taught me how important it is not just to read these land acknowledgements, but to understand how they relate to the work that we're doing. And that's absolutely one of my goals is to continue to, to learn and to do that more. I also want to thank you. Now, you, normally this comes at the end. Stephanie thought I'd made a mistake in my slides, but I again want to thank you for being here. And I want to thank you, especially those of you who are here from the media, because I know that it is a very crowded media landscape, that there is a lot going on, that there are very few um, media outlets in Canada that have dedicated health reporters who can spend 100% of their time on health issues. So I know that it, um, when being here means that you're not somewhere else, and I just want to thank you for that. I also want to acknowledge that we know that organ donation and transplantation is a small part of the health landscape in Canada. While in 2020, there were 490 living donors here in Canada, 730 deceased donors, and 2,594 people who received solid organ transplants, that number pales in comparison to the quantity of some other health issues in Canada. And I tried to make this to scale and that the, the numbers just were so tiny that you couldn't even see them. So this isn't to scale, but there were over 300,000 people who died after heart attacks in Canada in 2020. And of course, at least 3.64 million COVID cases, that many reported, but of course, many, many more that took up a lot of what we talked about. Um, and uh, so we know that ODT numbers are small. 
But I would argue that ODT is and should be a part of our national identity. So Belen talked about in her presentation how much the national identity of Spain is tied into what they do around organ donation and transplantation. And I would argue that the same is true in Canada. Of course, there's no story more public or more um, uh, known to the public probably than the story of Logan Boulay, one of the young people who died in the humble bus crash and whose parents on what is the worst day of any parent's life saw, were able to see through their grief and donate organs so that other people could live even as their son, even as they were saying goodbye to their son. And of course, Logan's uh, donation did not affect only his recipients, but the whole Canadian community, right? They started Green Shirt Day, a day where we recognize organ donors and promote organ donation. This is the Winnipeg sign here in Winnipeg lit up green on our last uh, uh, Green Shirt Day just last week. This is the Boulay family in Tabor, Alberta, speaking to a group about organ donation and transplantation. We care about this in Canada. And it's not just huge stories like Logan's, which of course the Humboldt tragedy is one that all Canadians know, but there are smaller stories too. There's the story of Sharon Kidwell, of Prince George, uh, who received a kidney transplant and her story was covered in the Prince George Citizen. Josiah Munn from Fredericton, who got a heart transplant just a couple of weeks ago and CTV Atlantic covered his story. Or closer to my home, Tyler Neufeld, who died a few years ago and his family was able to donate his organs. He's here from Steinbach, Manitoba. And as Tim talked about, those stories are so important. It's important that we tell them well. And it's important because we still have work to do. Because although Canada is, you know, in the top third of countries for our deceased donor rates um, in 2020, and even maybe in the top quarter for living donor rates, we still lag far behind countries like Spain and the US and deceased, Turkey and Israel and living donation. And because we don't have enough organs to go around, there were 292 Canadians who died in 2020 while active on transplant waiting lists. And we need to change those numbers. Tim spoke to it a bit, but I want to emphasize something that we tell all of our patients and that I think is so important to say in media reports, that transplant is not a cure. If you are a transplant recipient, you will be trading and organ disease, which is terrible and often deadly, for another condition, one where you need to take immunosuppression medication for the rest of your life. You need to have other medications usually to deal with all those side effects of the immunosuppression. You need to come see doctors and nurses and hospitals for monitoring and medical care. You need money to pay for these expensive medications, even if you have a good provincial uh, drug plan or private insurance. And as a pediatric nephrologist, I'm acutely aware that you might also need a second or third transplant over your lifetime. So I think it's important that when we're telling these stories that we reflect this reality. It's not all sunshine, and we need to be able to tell the whole story of transplant. Now, interestingly, we are working in science, not myself personally, but the ODT community on something called tolerance, which would mean that we actually would put in these organs and be able to use therapies so that the body would not um, be rejecting these organs and that all of these things need for constant immunosuppression would uh, decrease. So while transplant is not a cure, I'm hoping for a future where that is one day the case. And that's the other thing I wanted to talk about, the exciting science that's happening in the ODT landscape. So again, Tim talked about the xenotransplant story, the, the first pig to human xenotransplant with this genetically modified pig, um, which was news all across the world, and deservedly so. This is a big deal, and it's something that we need to talk about. There's a lot of scientific, ethical, and policy impl implications of such a transplant, and it deserves attention. But there are also so many other science stories related to transplant that de deserve attention. This is just a sprinkling of um, articles published in the last month by CDTRP researchers, patient partners, and scientists. There is one about home-based exercise. There is one about living liver transplantation for acute liver failure. There is one about how kidney donors fare with insurance and other traits after they donate. And there's really exciting uh, research about withdrawal of life-sustaining measures and how vital signs um, change at the end of life. These are amazing stories that got only a fraction or none of the media attention of the xenotransplant story, but they're being done here in Canada by amazing researchers, and I think that we can give them more attention. So how do we do it? 
we need to be asked about our research. We want to talk, oh, sorry, we want to talk about our research, but let's face it, <laughs> we're nerds. We don't always have the, the science communication skills to be able to talk about what, what we're doing. And so we absolutely need to work with journalists to do that. We also do really need to avoid that science hype. Our universities and our um, the people who send out press releases want to talk about our science as if it's the most newest exciting thing and that it exists um, separate from everything else that's happening. It's so special. The truth of science is that it's iterative, that we build on the work of others again and again and again, and it's a process and that we need to acknowledge how big that process is. I wanna talk very briefly about miracles and it doesn't take long when you look into media reports to see a story about miracles. This is one from a UK newspaper just a couple of days ago about a woman who had two kidney transplants and then was able to get pregnant with uh, and have twins. It's wonderful and it's called a miracle story and they go in the article talking about how the doctors told her it would never happen. What happened for this woman is one definition of a miracle. But I like to think of miracles as an amazing product or achievement, an outstanding example of something, something the people worked really hard to help this woman do with the science and technology that we have to help her. And of course, everything that she did herself. Some people view miracles as a surprising or welcome event that's not explicable by nature and that is the work of God or a divine agency. And that's fantastic. We should be talking more about faith and spirituality and health all the time. What's not awesome is this third definition of a miracle, a highly improbable or extraordinary event that, that nobody said what happened and that beat all the odds. And I have to say that as a, as a physician, when I see stories in the media where they say the doctor said it would never happen, I'd like to stand up and say once in a while, well, we actually did talk about this. So much of the communication that we have is about the known, but also the unknown. What could happen? What might happen? And I think responsible media stories are going to reflect that. If I can close by just highlighting one responsible media story that I just absolutely love, and I think Alan's in the audience today, is a story from the, the Free Press uh, here in Winnipeg uh, a couple of years ago. Alan Small, a journalist at the Free Press, got a kidney through living donor paired exchange from his friend, Jill. And he, they both tell an amazing story here, but he finishes off his um, part of the story by talking about a miracle. He says, I look back at the last 14 years and the whole thing is a miracle. The doctors and the nurses who got me back on my feet, the medical team that looked after me before and during dialysis, the people who helped me during and after the transplant, my friends, my family, who cheered me up when they cheered me on, and living donors, and Jill. What do you say when thank you falls so far short? Because of her, I have time to come up with an answer. So we talked about the miracle as the people who made them, and for me, it really touched me when I read this. So again, I went over a couple of things today and tried not to go too far over my time, but I wanna thank you so, so much for being here, being part of our workshop today. And I look very much forward to the discussion that we have. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Habiba. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you guys see me? Yes. All good. Okay. And you can yeah. hear me. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Aviva. If you don't mind, would you mind actually posting the link to that article? Because it just, it, the ending, it just got me all teary. Um, I'd really appreciate that if you wouldn't mind sharing that. Sure. Those... I'll, I'll look for a thumbs up from Alan to do so, but it is in the Free Press archives. If he's okay with it, so am I. <laughs> Thank you. And, and really, Timothy and Aviva, very informative presentations. We're going to now move to a bit of a break. We should be back in five minutes. So, you know, grab yourself a coffee, use the ladies' room or the men's room, and uh, I'll see you in five.
Hey, welcome back. I'm now going to introduce you to our panelists for the panel discussion. Dr. Shefeli, and I hope that I'm saying that correctly, Sandal is a transplant nephrologist, an associate professor at the McGill University Health Center, and an investigator at the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center. Her clinical and research interests are to improve rates of and access to living donor kidney transplantation and retransplantation using health system approaches. She has over 30 peer-reviewed publications and has received a clinical faculty development research grant from the American Society of Transplantation, a kidney health research grant from the Kidney Foundation of Canada, and a research innovation grant from the Canadian Donation and Trans transplant research program to support this work. That's a lot of accomplishments. We're very pleased that you're going to be joining us today. And we also have Dr. Blair Bingham. He's an award-winning journalist, scientist, and attending emergency physician based in Toronto and a critical care fellow at Stanford University in California, focused on improving science communication. He was a global journalism fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs, and that's a big accomplishment, an associate scientist at St. Michael's Hospital. His work has appeared in the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, the New England Journal of Medicine, and the Canadian Medical Association Journal, among many others. He frequently appears on television and radio. Thank you so much for joining us, doctors. Hi, and I'll be introducing our other two uh, panelists today. Heather Badnock is a non-directed living donor and a communication strategist. As the president of Village PR, she provides strategic communications, direction and training to not-for-profit clients in community and health. An active transplant volunteer, Heather helps transplant candidates find living donors by running their public appeals, small and large, pro bono. She also mentors a potential living, she also mentors potential living donors on the path to living donation. Heather is a volunteer with the UHN Center for Living Organ Donation and the Canadian Donation and Transplant Research Program. Dr. Stephen Reed is a clinician at heart and has completed postgraduate training focused on adult critical care medicine, as well as thoracic and cardiovascular anesthesia. His current clinical focus is in the intensive care unit. Dr. Bede currently holds the position of president for the International Society of Organ Donation and Procure Procurement. Having served as the medical director for the Nova Scotia Organ and Tissue Donation Program since its inception in 2006, he continues to contribute to the development of optimal care for organ and tissue donation by also serving as the clinical lead for the new presumed consent legislation that has passed in Nova Scotia. He has also served at the national level by having served as national chair of the Deceased Donation Advisory Committee as well as serving as a member of the Organ Donation and Transplantation Expert Advisory Committee for Canadian Blood Services. Saifali, you can uh, start now with your uh, five minute commentary. Uh, perfect. So I loved what Bilan said about good control. Pardon? Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I love what Bilain said about good control of information. And the reason I think that was such a good phrase is because of the following, uh, that I just wanted to share my screen if I'm allowed. And- uh, Sure, yes. Because of things like these. Now, I know I'm playing on the passions of the people who are watching this, but I just want to point out a couple of headlines that appeared in quite reputable newspapers over the last few years uh, that have um, that affected me, affected my patients. So a line like this. Recently, something like this. And second, something like this. So that's where I think it's so important to have a good control of information because as Timothy said, people will catch on to stories that resonate with them. And these stories do resonate, these headlines, these stories do resonate uh, with, uh, with people because uh, it might be personal, it might, uh, you know, 
raise your passions and you might get more involved, you might start discussing it. Uh, and what I like, it's not a term I invented, but what I hear about is information warfare. Um, I'd also add to that is that there is COVIDization of the news that is being reported. So in all of, while all of this is going on in the interest of science and medicine, I do like the phrase a lot, which is called good control of info information as Billy said. How do we do that? How can, um, how, how can we control the information that comes out in the newspapers? Social media, we cannot, but how can we do that? The, the news that comes out of reputable sources uh, of, um, uh, uh, in, in other places. So that is what I wanted everyone's opinions on uh, because um, that we get that something to discuss uh, perhaps later on. And the other thing that I, I wanted to say is that, you, you know, I, I think there are two aspects of good control of information. So number one, I do think that physicians and scientists should be involved somehow um, in vetting out the information that goes out. And uh, I understand the implications of that because everybody will start talking about the charter and the constitution and free speech, et cetera. But I, I think there are some limits to, um, I, I do think that these should be revised overall, but uh, you know, for instance, I'll give a simple example. Pharmaceutical advertisement is prohibited in Canada, but it's allowed in the US. And I feel like there should be some kind of a control that scientists and physicians should have in the kind of news that goes out about transplantation. Um, and, but Aviva mentioned that we can't do that alone. We are nerds. We wouldn't know how to create that catchy line uh, that, uh, you know, that people can resonate with. Uh, so I, I think journalists and uh, scientists and doctors need to work together to somehow give a unified message out and control the information while we are in this information warfare and in this um, uh, in, the, in the midst of the covidization of the news that's coming out. Uh, one more point I just want to make uh, because, and I'll be short, uh, I know many people have raised some excellent questions, it is uh, the involvement of health professionals in social media. And I am not as much as I use social media, I'm not a great person who engages. I have very few followers on Twitter and uh, I have my Instagram, which is private and I don't use Facebook. Uh, but I, I recently asked trans professionals, what do you think about that? What do you think about the fact that we as physicians um, and are not involved in social media? And most of them said, that it is actually a missed opportunity. Transplantation is one field that people can really, like, re, like it can really resonate with people. Transplantation stories can really resonate with people. And it's a missed opportunity that we don't do enough of it, that we don't, with an appropriate ethical oversight, share uh, inspiring, uh, stories of our patients. And I'll share one more screen if I'm allowed, because one of the person who has done a great job at this is this individual, it's Dr. Erwin Soin, who is, um, who was a co-co, uh, like somebody I asked this question to in the in that paper that I wrote, a perspective. Now he shares these amazing stories and I'll just share two with you, something like this. It's, it's such a cute story and how can you not like this? How can this not um, increase uh, transportation. And he shares these stories, these amazing stories. They're all over his uh, feed. I'll share one more if I scroll down. Right here. You know, two women shared, uh, donated their liver to their fathers and he posted their pictures and he did it with the appropriate oversight. So that's where I think, uh, I think we as a medical community do need to engage more uh, in two ways, not just to promote our field, but also to be involved in the control of information that goes out about our field. And that is all that I would say. And I'd love to hear uh, everyone's thought on how can we do that by staying within the law, within uh, you know, the ethics of our profession. Thank you, Shafali. I'll jump in with my five minute commentary. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'd like all of you to think about your day-to-day -day at work, whether you work in a newsroom, a hospital, a clinic, or an office, 
And using your reactions button on Zoom, give me a thumbs up if the majority of your success at work comes from textbook knowledge and your university training. And give me a heart if most of your success at work comes from the relationships and the in-depth knowledge you have of the place around you that can't really be found in a book. Just take a second to give me, oh, there we go. I'm seeing a lot of hearts popping up. Let me scroll through some screens here. I'm not seeing thumbs ups. Oh, I got one thumbs up there. So I'm seeing a lot of hearts. I think that what those hearts represent is a deep understanding of the ecosystem of where you work. You understand the people, you understand the politics, you understand the policies, the economic incentives, and what really drives change. You understand the ecosystem of where you work. And what we need to do in the medical community, I think, is better understand the science communications ecosystem. How does information move about the world? And how does that information change people's behavior when it comes to decisions that could affect their health? And the science communications ecosystem is rapidly evolving. And COVID has showed us just how much it's evolving. And physicians and organizations that want to communicate health topics need to up their game. We have seen the damage that is caused by misinformation and disinformation on both social media and in the popular press when that accuracy is lost and when emotions take over and we end up getting distortions of the truth. We need to be able to be involved in that discourse so that we can guide it because we can't control information in the public sphere. But what we can do is contribute to the discourse that's happening. And hopefully we're able to guide that discourse in a direction where individual people are able to make good health choices for themselves. So how do we prepare ourselves to compete in a very noisy ecosystem? I think we need to play the long game and better train ourselves to participate. And I'm not talking about traditional media training that is often run by hospital organizations because traditional media training is fatally flawed because it's delivered with two main goals, even though they won't show up in the objectives of the syllabus. And that's because the organization is there primarily to protect itself. The organization is not necessarily there to advocate for public health, for organ transplant, or for the public at large. They're always going to default to protecting themselves. That's natural. That's what those uh, PR professionals are paid to do. And when they train people in media communications, they train them with that angle in mind. The next thing they're there to do is promote. But again, they're there to promote the institution that they represent. And so what I'd like to uh, um, advocate for is a shift in the way we train physicians to participate in that dialogue and communication. And that shift is to bring in simulation. Physicians, nurses, paramedics, respiratory therapists, we're all used to simulation as a training tool to get better at delivering healthcare. We can also bring in simulations of a newsroom. And so at Stanford, what we've been doing is playing with the idea of a simulated newsroom, where we bring medical students, residents, fellows, faculty, and allied health into a situation where we put them in the role of journalist, editor, and news consumer. And we run them through exercises, not from the perspective of an organization, but from the perspective of the journalists who we hope they will interact with more and more. We teach really good storytelling tricks that I'm not gonna elaborate on now because so many of our wonderful speakers have already touched on them, but making sure that we're not framing clinical decisions the way we do in clinic or for me in the emergency department, but rather that we frame them more as a story less statistics, more people, more emotion. That's how our brains are wired to interact with stories. And so by putting physicians through longitudinal storytelling training, I think they'll be better suited to engage the public in the health communications ecosystem and better advocate for whatever it is they feel needs advocating. And I'll pause my comments there and I really look forward to the debate. Thanks so much, Blair.
I guess I'm going to jump in here. Um, so I just want to say first that I am in Ottawa and I'm on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. So speaking of media today, I personally became a living donor after seeing a local child's public appeal in the paper. And what immediately jumped out at me is that Jana and I were the same blood type and I'm lucky enough to have good health. And in that split second, decided that I could help. And so I applied to give to Jana that same day, later learned the really good news that she had received uh, the transplant that she needed from the dad of one of her school friends. And then I stayed in the process and became a non-directed living donor um, liver in 2018. But it was a media story that got me started in the first place. As Mary mentioned, I'm a communication strategist and I've worked with the media for more than, than 20 years. And journalists want to tell compelling and also unique stories. And I think what not everybody, not everybody realizes is that they welcome hearing from you with story ideas. And what I'd like to focus on is that these story ideas can include people looking for living donors. And so after becoming a donor myself, I became much more involved in transplant and learned about the long and, and at times devastating list um, and how often people are unsuccessful at finding living donors and don't get the life-saving transplant that they need. So as a, a pro bono volunteer, I've started helping patients on the waiting list with their, their public appeals, uh, small and, and large, from, from emails to, to friends and family that are really quite private to, to social media campaigns and media pitches to journalists. One of the patients that I've been helping was on the front page of the Ottawa Citizen three weeks ago, and that generated many, many phone calls to Toronto General, we're told, from people who are offering to, to be screened to give to her. Thanks to the many excellent speakers, you've heard lots of tips already for working with the media. Um, so to build on what's been said so far, I'd like to be really specific and talk about the key messages and the important points to make for anybody here that's supporting patients through the process to find a living donor for themselves. Because all too often, by the time someone um, comes to me, they've exhausted, you know, family and friends, and they're not really sure where to go next. And so for anybody who's here, who's, who's working with, with patients. So if you're a, you know, a social worker, a clinician, et cetera, please ensure that your patients know the blood type, if they're looking for a liver, the blood type that they are eligible to receive from. So many liver patients know their own blood type, but don't know the range that they are eligible to receive from. So all too often I'm talking with a patient who's a positive and they don't realize that they can receive from a positive, a negative, O positive, O negative, and this makes the net much, much bigger. And then sometimes um, kidney transplant candidates don't know about kidney paired donation. And so they think that they also need to focus on blood type when in fact, the opportunities for them are so incredibly wide. When doing a public appeal, patients need to say the city that they are in and also the city that the transplant will take place in. And I say this because, you know, sometimes the hope if we've gone past friends and family, you know, if we've gone past that really kind of quiet phase and into a much broader maybe social media appeal, the farther away from their network that that post gets shared, which is of course the hope the less likely it is that someone knows, oh, you know, you're Sheila from Ottawa. They don't now know if this is Sheila from Texas or Edmonton or where exactly Sheila is. So, you know, saying where you are and seeing where the transplant will take place is incredibly helpful. Also, an incredibly important key message is how to contact the transplant center to get more information and to apply to be a donor. I cannot tell you the number of times that we see media articles where there's been an incredibly compelling story written about someone who needs a transplant with no information on how to apply. And it's heartbreaking to think that this all this work is going to go to waste. And I can't tell you how often I reach out to that media publication or that newsroom myself to say like, I found the link, please add it to the online story right away. 
emphasize also, and I really appreciate um, touching on um, past public appeals that received, you know, better or worse um, coverage or were more negatively or positively received, because one of those really negatively received appeals led to this notion that public appeals are queue jumping when in fact public appeals are quite the opposite. And so we often say in, in appeals that go public that, and this is oversimplifying, you know, so clinicians don't all email me at once here, but by finding a living donor, a patient gets themselves off the waiting list for a deceased donor and everyone else behind them moves up by one. Again, don't all contact me at once. And so the living donor in fact saves two lives. And that is the opposite of queue jumping. And we encourage people looking for transplants to talk about how being on the waiting list and, and how needing a transplant and being this sick is impacting their life. What's it like to need dialysis however many times a week? What's it like to be so sick that you have to get, you know, your ascites drained or you deal with the brain fog or how debilitating it is for you? And also the hope that you have for what your life is going to look like post-transplant. What are the hobbies and interests that you miss or the, the sports or the grandchild you want to visit in Germany? Or um, you know, what are the things that you're looking forward to? Please also tell your patients to talk about their hobbies and interests. Most of the time in the stat from the Toronto General Living Liver Donor Program is that 97% of living donors will give to someone they know. And so you're most likely to find your living donor from amongst your extended network, your family, your friends. I've read two stories about people who gave to someone they went to school with 50 years ago because they saw that their public appeal. And so when you're doing your appeal, talk about your hobbies, your interests, your workplace, schools you've attended, and, and more. Last year, I worked on a public appeal for a gentleman named Wes this is very much public, um, and, and Wes is a, is a cyclist in Toronto. He had liver cancer, and I say had because we found him a, a donor, and the photo that we used for Wes's public appeal shows him in cycling gear, and he, his public appeal got picked up and spread throughout the Toronto cycling community, not because they all knew him, but because he was one of them. And so they spread that appeal like wildfire. Of course, Wes found a donor from a friend of a friend, someone he'd met distantly and had a successful transplant um, and is, is doing really well. So this is some key tips to build on the excellent information that's already been shared. Um, I encourage anybody who's working with patients uh, to help them find living donors to make sure that you're sharing this kind of information with them. I am working on a, a project funded by a, a Canadian foundation to scale up what I currently do one-on-one -on -one with patients to support them as a volunteer because we want more patients to understand how to help themselves and how to get the support that they need. Um, so some of you may be hearing from me uh, in the coming months and you're always welcome to, to put questions in the chat or to, to reach out. So uh, thank you, thank you so much for the chance to speak and I'm handing it off to Stephen next. Well, thank you very much. And, and thank you for the invitation. This is really quite, a, quite an amazing panel. And as I was contemplating what I might be able to contribute, uh, I, I struggled a little because I, I don't quite know where I fit in, except I reflected on how I started this journey. And I've, I've thought about maybe a theme that, that the people listening as opposed to the people on this, this panel might might reflect on is the potential power of the medical voice. Because when I started, I kind of assumed the leadership of this program and had no idea that people would start phoning me to speak about this topic and that the reporters in the neighborhood might actually look to me as an authority. Why they wanna to talk to me, what do I know? What I've learned over the years is that the power of the medical voice is still substantial for good or bad, as we've discovered you know, some, some, you know, bizarre theory gets way more traction because the guy or, or girl who's proposing it has, has doctor in front of their name. That's just a reality. But my point in, in bringing this forward is for many of our community, whether they're lay public or whether they're the healthcare community at large, the medical voice still carries a lot of weight 
And it struck me how random the selection was for who that medical voice should or would be in my community. I ended up inheriting this because I was the phone number that they had. And, and that was way too random for what could or should be a really powerful, powerful opportunity. And over the years, I've discovered a bunch of things. One of them is that not everybody is good or comfortable with interacting with the, the media. It's intimidating for some people who have an enormous skill set in other areas. And so one of my pleas as we collectively try to move an agenda forward is to look to your, your professional circle and the selection of who should be that spokesman shouldn't be random. It really should be who's the best storyteller in your group, so to speak. You know, that's actually a skill set that that some people either innately have or they develop, but it's different between people and they need to be the person who gets to tell that story. It will resonate. It's not something that's inherited if you want to be effective. I didn't appreciate how the medical voice can or will resonate, and it's it does. The other thing that I've discovered is that in many cases, the media that you're dealing with, especially in today's day and age where reporters are pulled in many directions, they got that assignment from their editor that morning. The day before they were hiring, they were covering you know, a new playground on the other side of the city. They don't know this topic. And so your responsibility often before you go on air is to flavor the message that you need them to be communicating, filling them in on the backstory. Quite commonly, I will do a, a three minute segment that will be a one hour conversation. So that when the, when the reporter and their editor are putting things together, they have context that doesn't come from a three minute conversation. And I didn't appreciate that in the beginning, but it's certainly true now. The other thing that I really like doing is I like doing live interviews because then I'm controlling the message. There's a lot of situations where the 30 minute conversation with a reporter is distilled down to a sound bite that they picked that may or may not be the right message. The reality, I guess, as, as we listen to these conversations and contemplate the 60 people out there who are listening is, is that the communication with our colleagues and with the public at large is really important. It can be very, very powerful. And so I think we need to collectively address it as a strategic priority, as, a, as opposed to the thing that, that Joe's going to do today, so to speak. And if we need to be trained, whether it's in simulation, I, I like what that was uh, discussed, or some other avenue, don't make it as random as it often is in most environments. I think that that is an opportunity lost. Um, the other thing that I really wonder about as we contemplate the media at large, and we've, we've alluded to social media as a separate category, where does the entertainment industry fit into this? The number of people who sort of talked about, you know, they saw, I don't know, a heart transplant episode on Grey's Anatomy or something. It may be foolishness, but those things in the public media or, or the public sphere that are driven by the entertainment objective actually do influence what some people think happens in the real world. And we need to at least be prepared to address some of the crazy things that Hollywood might have put out there. I'll stop at that point, but the take home message I think is the potential power of the medical voice, good or bad, I think is something that we need to be focused on so that we can actually turn it into the good, if you will. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Bede. Um, now we're at the part where um, everybody else can participate and we'll um, move on to questions from the audience. Again, feel free to use the chat box or raise your virtual hand. Christina will be moderating this session and I'll be uh, taking care of the chat box for any comments or questions. Over to you, Christina. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I just wanna comment on something that uh, Dr. Reed just said. Right now I'm working in a different field. I'm working in documentaries and investigative journalism, but most of my career has been as a daily news reporter. Um, even when I'm covering Queens Park, it's a daily news reporter. So I just wanna give people here that aren't journalists a sense of what a journalist day is. My work day would start at 10 a.m., but that means that by 6.30 in the morning, 
I'm already reaching out to people trying to figure out what my story is because nobody has ever assigned me a story. Period, full stop. It is my job to come to the table with a new idea every single day, barring, of course, massive breaking news. I'm not a crime reporter, so this is my this was my experience and has been my experience. So every day I have to have a brand new story idea by 10 a.m. That is feasible. That means that between 6.30 and 10 a.m., not only do I have to get ready and you know, potentially commute to work and be TV ready, I have to have done all my research, found my sources, confirmed interviews. By 3 p.m., my story has to be done. By 3 p.m., if I am driving around the city of Toronto, I have had to have all of my interviews done because I have to start writing and hand it over to an editor who can put it all together quickly because my newscast starts at 5 p.m. So if you are a, uh, I'm just saying this on behalf of all journalists, if you are a professional, be available. If you're not available, that's cool, but potentially be a really nice person and say, I can't do it, but listen, my colleague, uh, Dr. Singh can help you out, or my colleague, an RN in this field, she can help you out. These are really important things. Otherwise, the stories don't get told, and I'll move on to something else that might not be as good. And that's my experience, but that is the experience that I've had working at CTV and working at City TV. So I think that that's really important, is that you have to get back to people quickly, and their deadlines are not... Um, they're non-negotiable because if I don't have a story, like my job every day was to fill two minutes of black. And if you want a nice write-up, because I always prefer to read the articles, I never watch a news story, like a video on my phone or online, I read the articles, the earlier the better, because then I can give way more context. And that's important to me because I love the, the narrative that um, Dr. Bingham brought up, but I also really love the stats because I'm a, my background's in public policy. So I want that information and the best way to convey it is in an article. So that's my pro tip for that. Um, but reaching out to the professionals, what stories do you think aren't being told within the organ transplant uh, and donation world? Any takers? Can I say health equity? Um, I would love to see more health equity stories being told. I've tried to pitch them a couple of times, I think with permission, of course, I think about Dr. Mushi's work um, at um, UHN about how, um, you know, racialized people disproportionately face longer wait times to find living donors. And I feel like that story hasn't necessarily been told. When I helped a woman last year to find a living donor, she is a racialized low income newcomer and we discussed whether or not she was comfortable with that story being told and for her she she wasn't and so we didn't make the link in that case but um I think that that's there is solid research at this time focused on kidney as far as I, I know um but I, I really would love to see those stories being told more okay I think there's a couple things that come up a lot that one of them is the general impression of Joe Q public who hasn't dealt with somebody who's awaiting a transplant, they don't understand that life while you're waiting for a transplant is really hard. Like, oh, well, you know, you're on dialysis, you'll be fine or whatever. No, they're living a really tough life. And, and I think that people who have family members or whatever who are on that list, they get it for sure. But the, the general population sort of have this, um, I don't know, uh, pasteurized version of of what life might be like for these patients it's really tough and the second theme that I think is is worth highlighting and I always do is when people think about transplantation they almost always look at it through the lens of the potential recipient we need more organs because somebody's life will be saved but one of the things I think we need to point out is that in many many cases the opportunity to help somebody is the only good news that's coming to a donor family. It's really, really uh, an important part of, of the legacy they carry forward of their loved one that some solace in the middle of what's nothing but bad news. It helps with the grieving process. So supporting donation and transplantation is clearly gonna help the recipients but it's also something we can do for the donor families. And that's one of the ways I've tried to connect it to ICU colleagues who are not donation focused 
It's like, well, this is really just part of optimal end of life care. It's not about finding an organ for some anonymous patient we've never met. It's about optimizing end of life care for the family that's right in front of you right now. So the donor benefit, that's an important thing. If, if I can add to what Stephen said there, I think, um, and sort of reflecting on what uh, Belen shared with us was um, one of the stories shared in Spanish media that struck me was a story of the people involved in creating the organ tissue donation community, right? There's a lot of those great stories um, to share. And it's, um, it's, it may be about how the organ tissue donation community has come uh, to be uh, what it is today. So there are some historical perspectives on how it was built, where we started and where we are now, what kind of things we're facing in the future, um, perhaps day-to-day um, -day operations of, of what, it, what it takes to uh, have a, somebody who's at the end of their life become a deceased organ donor and what it takes to transplant that organ um, to a recipient and identify the recipient, you know, get their trio team in place. And there are so many moving parts and there's so many individual stories to tell within that um, journey essentially, right? So I think that would serve for really well uh, for long, long form journalism, perhaps a, um, uh, a, a mini series of short, uh, short episodes, right? So, and people, I'm just reflecting what kind of things people like, and it's, you know, everybody loves Netflix. Everybody loves short series. That would be one thing that you can um, uh, consider. The other thing is um, on the donation side of things, a lot of our families um, who consent to be or considering org uh, organ donation for their loved ones um, are not fully aware of the um, steps involved. And, and one of the things that we've noticed at TGLN at least is that there is a growing, uh, the, the, the duration of time required from cons approach for consent to actual organ recovery gets, keeps getting longer. And that period of time is a difficult period of time for some families, right? So it's about managing expectations and not just of donor families, but also expectations of bedside clinicians of healthcare providers, right? Because um, a lot of the times, you know, bedside nurses may not fully understand why we, why, why is it taking so long for us to, to allocate organs um, or find a recipient or get the recovery team in place? Why is, and it may actually help us communicate with, um, if we highlight the, the challenge of waiting so long uh, to enable donation, it may help us to advocate for prioritizing OR times, for example, right? So a lot of the times OR administrators, we kept getting bumped, 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 bumped for organ recovery surgery because it's not a, it's not perceived by OR staff as those life-saving uh, surgery. So those kind of things can be, I think, shared more. I think that's a really good point, Merit. Um, I do want to point out one small thing, and I should have mentioned this earlier, is that, and it's a big hurdle for hospitals, is to allow journalists and to figure the consent around it to get the visuals, right? So I'll give the example of just my transplant story. Um, we covered it from the beginning to end and I did not make an appeal for living donors. Everybody that reached out to offer, I directed them to be a donor.ca. That's in Ontario, um, you know, where you can register to be an organ donor. I provided them with information about, you know, being a non-directed donor, but I wasn't using the platform for my benefit. One major problem is getting access to, um, to film actual procedures. So even though it was my transplant, um, that was not on the table for us to be able to film that. Uh, we filmed a lot of stuff in the hospital, but you can't get the visuals. And for a lot of the stuff, even if you don't have to be in, you don't have to be in the OR, and I'm speaking from a television journalist perspective, but to have the proper um, visuals is very important, particularly in visual storytelling, because interviewing a doctor in an empty, um, you know, a, I don't know what you would call them, those little rooms, I guess, where you go and get examination room, um, being, you know, interviewing a doctor there is boring and horrible and the white, the walls are white and there's it's a barren environment and it's not appealing. You need to have kind of like something cool to look at. So I'm just, I'm throwing that out there as somebody um, who works in the field on this side. And um, 
recommending, you know, talk to your PR professionals at your hospitals and the clinics that you work for, because that's important. I see that there's a lot of hands raised, but I've been keeping track on the order. And Sandra, uh, I see that you have a question. Yeah, thanks, Christina. So one of the things, I'm a liver recipient of 25 years and quite often share my story and sort of help direct what comes out of that story so it's not just about me. It helps improve the system. But one of the things I think media could help with is sort of normalizing death. So when we had recently, we had advanced care planning day. I think if we could normalize death and have people to have the conversation, um, you know, encourage people to have wills when they have property and children. And so that that becomes like uh, a norm, right? So I think, I don't know if that's what Spain's done, but like the fact that Canada is not very comfortable talking about death, I think explains why our numbers, 35%, that's still not a lot of people. We have 50% here in Muskoka, um, which is in Northern Ontario, which is good, but you know, it could still be better. But I think that if we have people to have the conversation, uh, make their end of life wishes and include organ donation, then we can normalize that conversation. So anytime there's advanced care days or anything that's talked about palliative care, I recently did a thing called the waiting room about palliative care. I even think we can start talking about palliative care within transplantation as well. Um, and then also what uh, Steven said too, yeah, I had that told to me so many times waiting for a liver. Oh, well, you could just go on dialysis. No, that's not for livers, that's for kidneys. And even going on dialysis for kidneys is not great. Who wants to spend anyway? So yeah, we need to make people realize. And the other thing is, is that what we're trying to do with COVID is get people to appreciate what a life is like living being immune compromised. And that's some of the articles I read. It seems like people don't care. Right, and they don't understand, and even the fact that we're not wearing masks and stuff like that. So, those are just some key areas. Sandra, I think these are really good points, and trust me, I hear you. Um, not wearing a mask is not an option for me right now. I'm going to head over to Dr. Sandal. You did have your hand up. Oh, you still do. Okay, great. Um, I love what you said about visual. I, I think that's what we don't do enough of. Uh, having that visual of the patient, of the family, uh, like we, we have so many of these misinformations. So like, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not to a certain extent that, oh, if you donate, you, you can't get pregnant. How come we don't have stories of women who donated a kidney and then had a baby? How come we don't have that picture promoting uh, transplantation, uh, kidney transplantation? How come we don't have a similar story with a liver transplant? I, I think having those positive stories of the patient, their caregiver and their family would be amazing. How come we don't have a picture of a patient who after, once they were off dialysis, went to Barbados and takes a picture of the, sea, the ocean in the background and look, I'm off dialysis. That I think is missing. And something I, I, I saw um, Mad Men and I, I was reflecting on something they said, uh, how the cigarette industry uh, targets the young. And I think we don't do a good job of that. We, we're not targeting the young. The, the upcoming generation, I see it with my friend's kid, with my kid, they're so aware. They are so, I have so much faith in this generation. They know so much about climate change. I have a two-year-old who tells me to mask up if my mask is coming down. So I, I feel like, like targeting that young generation, uh, also, I don't think we're doing a good job of it. Uh, we're targeting like even newspapers young people are not I don't know how many of them read the newspaper but they are on TikTok they're on Twitter I, I don't know what else is new but uh, those are the two things I think we're not doing enough of um I just want to say UHN is doing a really good job and, and now now I'm starting to realize just because you said that Dr. Sandal um because UHN actually has these videos now talking about organ transplantation, where it's just people like talking about how it saved their life or how they're waiting. And it's like 30 second clips and they bring them to high schools. And so they air at different high schools and now like, it makes a lot more sense. So I'm really glad that you said that, but UHN is really great in that regard. Dr. Bingham, your hand's down now, but it was up for quite some time. Are you still willing to talk? Oh, I can always talk. <laughs> um, I just want to support everything that's been said, particularly around the need to be in a hospital and have visuals. Journalists like to see it for themselves. When I went to journalism school, I was taught that I was there to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And that sounds a little sort of hot pie in the sky, but our job is there to raise voices that can't be heard and challenge the voices that have the power to make a difference. And so often journalists will frame their work in what can be viewed as a negative light. 
But what we're doing is we're finding the tension in society and we're trying to highlight it because as a journalist, I believe that when we have difficult issues that we're wrangling with, the solution is best found if we have those discussions in public and not in back offices or in private meetings. So when we talk about what are the undertold stories, I would look at ourselves and say, where are we struggling? Where are we struggling in the organ donation community? And how can public discourse help us find a better way? And some of those might be around the difficulties with dying, ensuring legacy, making sure that people know that organ transplant is not just a one and done event. But let's ask ourselves, what are we struggling with? Where can the public discourse help us find a better way? And I think if you frame it like that, you're going to get every journalist's attention because that's their job. Their job is to improve and increase public discourse for thorny issues. Yes, that makes us seem like we're always sort of boo-hoo, very negative, but what we're trying to do is help, help society find a better way. And so I, try, I, I would hope that people could try to reframe their attitude towards the media as trying to build something better. And that means finding something that might need fixing. And the last thing I'll say is that you would be amazed how many of my stories die. I go down chasing something because it seems like there's something thorny there. I talk to a bunch of experts and I find out, oh no, things are actually working pretty well. I don't think that there's anything there that's gonna grab someone's attention and the story dies and I move on. Now you could say, why don't you do a story about how things are working great? And I would love to do more purely positive stories about rainbows and puppy dogs, but the information ecosystem is so packed, it's so noisy that people just won't read about it. And that's sort of just a reality that I struggle with very much as a physician who's also trying to bring out an advocacy angle is how do I be more positive? But sometimes the positive stories just don't have priority when people have thousands of links that they get to choose from every day. And just to add to that, and I think these are all really, really good points, uh, doctor, but people don't want to read about something happy. Generally speaking, yes, you want to have like your kicker story and the happy one, but happy stories don't make positive changes. That's it. You need to see the the person that's in need in order for you to decide to donate to the United Way or, you know, to to help uh, people that are experiencing homelessness. You you need to see that. Otherwise, it's just um, yeah. There's no act. There's no call to action when it's a happy story. And Christina, physicians can relate to that because no physician wants to book an appointment with someone who's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There right? you go. We're looking for someone who's sick. We're looking for someone who we can help. And I think right. that's also sort of a mentality that journalists share. That's a really good point. So I'm kind of a doctor then. Just kidding. Um, Fiona, you've had your hand up. Unmute. <laughs> I'm not as experienced at this as you guys are. Uh, hang on. There we go. Oh, unable to start video. Oh, well, you can't see me. Um, that's interesting. I, I can't start my video. Oh, there you go. We oh, see you now. Okay. Okay. Um, this is fascinating. Um, thank you everyone for all the information and stories and so on. I was transplanted uh, 35 years ago. Um, I'm a type one diabetic. I've been that for 53 years. And so it was a typical textbook case of renal failure, blah, blah, blah. I was dialyzed for a year. But since all that time, I have never really been involved with um, advocacy, fundraising, awareness, you name it, for either diabetes or renal failure. So I've suddenly, or in recent months, started becoming involved. And about a week ago, there was a Zoom meeting for what's called TAP, which is the Transplant Ambassadors Program. Um, and that is a, a program that's been running, I guess, I'm not sure for how long, but at Tor in Toronto. Um, we're just launching it but they are just launching it in Ottawa. So I've become involved and it's a fantastic program, which basically puts recipients and those who are, who are going to be donating an organ in touch with people who have received an organ or have donated, which is a wonderful idea. It's so they can share stories, share experiences, you know, provide a comfort level, um, the, the, the part of it that's non-medical. 
um, so to speak. Anyway, luckily, since that Zoom meeting, I reached out to someone I know who's connected with media. I actually have an interview with a newspaper, the Ottawa Citizen Reporter, on Friday. But I guess what I'm asking is, do I have any ability or is it advisable to ask the reporter what they're looking for? Because I mean, the, the, the launch of the TAP program is, is, is great. It's a wonderful concept. None of that stuff existed when I was transplanted 35 years ago at TGH. And there's a long story behind that, which I won't bore you with. But, um, you know, so the, there's the launch of the TAP program. There's the all of the things we've talked about here today, uh, you know, living donor programs and advocacy and, you know, jumping the list is not the case and all kinds of things. So is it is it fair or advisable for me to ask this journalist what they want to write about? <laughs> It a hundred percent is. In fact, um, it's nice if you just say, "Hey, just so I can focus my thoughts, send them a quick mm. email." Um, and so I've got you know ready answers for you. Uh, you know what what areas do you want to focus on? It, that's totally fine. Uh, okay. I don't know if there's any other journalists here that want to weigh in on this, Doctor Bingham. <laughs> I, I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to speak. So I'm just going to, um, I'll hold my thoughts for a few minutes. Okay. I can, I can weigh in from experience. Also knowing Fiona, who it is that you're going to be speaking with. Um, yes. <laughs> and she's, she's delightful, by the way. She's really wonderful. And um, I he's also a friend of a friend of mine. So <laughs> well, he's great. Six degrees of separation. <laughs> um, I find journalists are often uh, really willing to, um, to tell you in advance the sorts of things they're thinking about or what prompted their interest in the story or who else they're speaking to. Um, you know, a time when they're not willing to do that in advance, which is not the case here, is if it's going to be maybe a more contentious interview, you know, you're a politician who's done something wrong and they need to put you on the hot seat, um, which is which is fair. Um, journalists won't always send you in advance like a list of questions that they're going to ask, but oftentimes for someone who's not a professional PR person who is doing an interview for the first time, um, I find they're really willing to say like, here's the gist of what we're going to we're going to talk about and um, and also it's okay for you to say Fiona um, and I mean Christina would know better than I do but I do find that if there's a point that's really important to you to get across and you've had a lovely long conversation with Liz on Friday and then um, you say to Liz you know Liz what's most important to me that that appears in this story is is this I feel really strongly that you know this um, needs to be in there then it's just good for mm -hmm. her to know that as well if you've talked about a lot of different things. Well, and also to take your point from earlier, making sure that there are some links in the story where people can find out more about it, yeah. about how to be a donor, as an example, or how to, you know, yeah. find out so about the program. Yeah. I've been known to just send a follow up email to just like thank a journalist for the, the conversation sure. and, and to say, like, as promised, here's the link to this, this and this, or here's the, the source for that stat that I mentioned, or um, yeah, because journalists are just incredibly busy and anything we yeah. can do to be helpful is also just helpful I think with the relationship yeah great thank you very much thanks big kiss to you Heather <laughs> big kiss to you I know that we have a lot of hands up and I'm sorry we haven't even gotten to Mary who I know is probably moderating tons of stuff on the chat um but we are up for time so I'm just gonna be able to go to one more of you um and uh Sunny you've had your hand up the longest uh, I thought my brown hand was lost in. It in, kind of is small, in the background. Yeah, I apologize. Uh, I'm an ICU physician. I just want to thank everyone uh, for just an amazing discussion. Um, been involved in this topic for so long, and everything resonates from all the different viewpoints. So thank you. Uh, maybe I don't know. I hope there there's time for the panel to talk about this. But what I'm recognizing is this is about culture change for Canadians, right? And I think everyone's brought that up in a little piece. And when I remember big culture change, you know, like seat belts and, you know, drinking and driving, it was the youth, I think, that really made the change. I remember, sadly, telling my dad, uh, I think you've had too much to drink. You can't drive. And so what are we going to do to mobilize our youth from the media standpoint? 
Um, maybe a specific question. What are the role of influencers in social media? Um, is this something we can do to get, maybe we're, maybe we're looking to the wrong people, not the people who are in their 60s reading their newspapers, but maybe a younger generation. Any comments from the panel, please? How big a budget do you have, Sunny? <laughs> uh, let's say I'm loaded. Let's say. <laughs> if you're let's loaded, say. it's the way to go. There, I, I think the information ecosystem is split in two more or less. There's sort of the organic social media, and then there's a the traditional press, which is both sort of, uh, sort of what would be considered traditional and new media. Uh, so we'll call that the popular press. The popular press, as Belen was saying earlier, involves knowing your journalists. If you're working in, in health advocacy in Canada, you should know every single health journalist who's on that beat. You should be friends with them. You should have their cell phone. You should be communicating with them every couple of months and catching up. You build those relationships. They'll come to you, you'll go to them, and you'll have a lot of trust with each other. And that's the way to go on the popular press, I think. When it comes to social media, I'm struggling with this because the algorithms are changing every day. Every year, there's a new platform that's doing better than the others. It used to be that if I got a thousand retweets, I was having a great day. Now on TikTok, you're looking at 800,000, 900,000 likes or views, and then your video's done well. The standards are always changing and the way those platforms are interacting with, the, with each other changes. As a brief example, if I post a link in Twitter that takes somebody out of Twitter's website, it counts against me. Twitter doesn't want you leaving. Twitter wants you to go deeper into Twitter. Understanding this type of ecosystem is really important and influencers understand that. Their job is to get your message out there. Sometimes you pay a fee, sometimes it's earned media, which means free media, and they do it because they believe in what you're doing. But just like I try to know every journalist in Canada on the health beat, I'm also trying to get to know all of the influencers out there who have access to an audience that I don't have access to. I think I need to um, just say ting, ting, ting. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're, we are just, uh, as Christina's pointed out, we are just uh, at the end of our time. Um, my question was going to be, could someone please speak to the issue of false equivalency that Tim raised, but we'll save that for next time. Um, this has been an amazingly engaged and interactive group of people, and I want to thank all of you for participating so enthusiastically, for sharing your thoughts and your expertise, um, and uh, uh, you know, it's been a, a really terrific audience as well as um, as panelists, uh, as well as moderators. And so I'd really like to thank you so much uh, to everybody for joining uh, this conversation. This is the first of what we anticipate will be a number of workshops. Um, and Blair, just to move on from exactly what you were saying, you've positioned us well for the next workshop, which will be on May 17th, and it will be specifically on social media. Uh, and so we will all be able to learn more about um, the kinds of things that certainly uh, maybe the younger and influence, uh, you know, the influencers and so on. I had to get my head around what an influencer was, but um, we'll be able to hear more about that. I'd also like to thank the CDTRP team for, uh, as usual, putting uh, putting on a terrific, um, you know, taking care of all these amazing um, links and smooth transitions from one thing to the other. So thank you so much to the team. And um, we will, uh, I think we have a method to somehow to gather up all the comments that were not addressed in the chat. And so we can have a chance to think about those and um, you know, perhaps bring those up at a later date. So once again, thank you everyone for your participation and engagement.